It's an absolute honour to have us have you with us today, Branka. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. It's such a pleasure to be here. Really nice to meet you. So, so uh, Branka, you founded AI for Peace, um, which is fantastic. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why you founded that organization and what you do at uh, AI for Peace? Sure. Well, um, when AI for Peace was founded, uh, the group of people that was engaged around it, we were all coming from peace building or humanitarian field or the development. And in our everyday work, we were facing with increased conflict, violence, insecurity, human rights violations. Uh, so there were plenty of problems and we were really searching for potential additional solutions or tools that, are, that can help us in our work. And this is how we ended up looking into artificial intelligence as well, uh, not only as a potential uh, helpful tool, but unfortunately, sometimes um, even uh, 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 through a need to protect peace from some of the utilization of artificial intelligence. Uh, and then with the availability of, of uh, big data, improved computer um, processing power, the, the lowering cost of data, we were actually, so these technologies were becoming more available uh, for different stakeholders, including us uh, in the peace building and humanitarian uh, field. Uh, and this is why we started looking in this direction, not as a, some sort of a, a, a magical solutions for the problems, but as a, as a potential helping tool. Uh, and what we noticed at that time, so now everybody are talking about AI, right? When we uh, started AI for Peace, not that many conversations were happening around it. In fact, um, most of the utilization and investment uh, in AI was going in, in military field. So what we were uh, looking was military use of AI that was multiple and advanced uh, military was using AI in uh, situational awareness, threat monitoring, um, autonomous weapon systems. Even today, this is where the majority conversation is when we talk about uh, uh, um, so-called killer robots. But what we noticed is that nobody is talking about this technology uh, in peace building field. And this is something that we wanted to, to change. And this is how we established this um, organization as a think tank that is focusing on, on studying this technology and understanding the real impacts, not, not the hype, but the real impacts of AI uh, and related uh, emerging technologies. Uh, and we established this organization with a vision to create a future in which AI can actually benefit uh, peace, sustaining peace, development, and, and human rights uh, protection. Um, we are functioning basically as an open hub. Uh, so we, we don't think that AI is only uh, for computer scientists anymore, for data scientists. We believe that this is a conversation that needs to be done among different uh, uh, stakeholders. So we are including uh, uh, different uh, researchers from universities, uh, civil society experts, uh, uh, and data scientists as well to be part of this conversation and to make sure that we develop artificial intelligence for sustaining peace. Yeah, that's really interesting. One of the things you mentioned there was the uh, the progress of uh, uh, processing power, which of course is just one dimension of advancement. Um, and I sometimes worry about the extrapolation of this capability and therefore the accessibility of it. In, in that context, what do you think are the you know most serious aspects of AI as it relates to the potential for humanity's destruction? I know that's a negative way to frame the question, but but you know it's, it's a very real possibility, right? that harnessed in the wrong way, uh, we can make some mistakes. What would you say to that? Yeah, th this is a very interesting question. And, and I, I don't, I, like, what I see now, especially, is people getting interested in this topic of, of thinking about potential 
uh, destruction of the planet. We we did not think we we were looking into AI more from the direction of what can what are the harms that AI can potentially do uh, to to our uh, everyday human rights, right? To to individuals, to us as humans, not necessarily in the framework of the destruction of of humanity. But I noticed that this debate debate is especially interesting now. This is not a new debate, right? The the debate about existential uh, risks um, and the existential risk that is coming from uh, AI. Scholars uh, have been arguing for, for many years and even decades now uh, uh, and, and pointing to the risks of AI surpassing the, the humanity in this general uh, intelligence and becoming a, a super intelligence system. Uh, and once it reaches that level, then it's very hard to control it, right? It's, it's actually impossible to control it. So, so there are these different problems of AI control, AI alignment. Um, and although, as I mentioned, the debate is not a, a new one, um, it was previously mostly conducted among this small group of scientists that were actually working on develop, developing the the, the uh, so-called AGIs, right? Artificial General uh, Intelligence. But what we are seeing and why it's interesting to have this conference in this specific moment is that what we see suddenly now is that this is becoming the discussion that is being made outside of this small circle of scientists that are actually working on on AGI, and suddenly everybody are discussing about this, right? No matter what you what you are doing, what your everyday profession is, and why this is happening, mostly because of the the release we probably are all following what is happening. We, we heard this throughout the day uh, today, right? The, the release and mass popularity of open AI's chat GPT and then GPT-4 and other AI uh, tools that are uh, built on large language models, LLMs from uh, Microsoft's Bing and, and Google's Bard to a number of um, other startups that are working on similar technologies. And this discussion, especially uh became interesting because of the release of this open letter right the, the letter that a group of uh, a large group of uh, experts uh, and people who are uh, engaged in this conversation signed calling for this pause um and now everybody started looking why do we need this pause are is there actually something really serious coming a serious risk coming from these technologies that we need this pause um, what is additionally interesting here, um, maybe for the audience to know that this letter was actually um, uh, put out there by an organization that is focused exactly on existential risks, uh, the Future of Life Institute, that is for years now looking into different potential causes and risks that, are, that can lead to uh, destruction of our humanity. And, and one of these causes potentially is now uh, what has been discussed is uh, AI. Um, I am not, well, not only I, but many, uh, researchers and experts are not actually agreeing on how close we are to, to that moment. And that's why I'm, I'm really amused by, the, by this question of humanity's destruction. We have a lot of other things to, to look into. Uh, one of my, uh, uh, favorite authors, uh, Amy Webb is calling this, uh, a thousand small cuts, right. That are happening on an everyday level that we need to be aware of and, and looking into, to be able to protect our humanities, not necessarily looking into, uh, this the humanity's destruction, uh, but again, we were wrong before. Um, we thought the same for nuclear uh, weapons, that we are far, far away from having such kind of technology. And then actually we proved ourselves wrong. Uh, uh, we created a, a potential, another risk to humanity's destruction. So maybe it's worth looking into uh, um, AGI as well and, and having these discussions on time. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that there are lots of different communities now getting involved in the discussion of AI, which I think is healthy, right? Policymakers, politicians, data scientists, technologists, and so on. What do you think are the most important considerations that we need to think about to make sure that the extrapolated future um, stays positive for humanity? Well, I, I think 
definitely having a conversation like like this one and and thinking uh, especially about how responsibly to to develop such technology right that at, at this moment we are all companies are pretty much rushing uh into developing these systems uh, and what I truly believe uh, is the the value, and many previous speakers talked about this, the value of actually having a proper ethical uh, frameworks for the development of, of such systems and, and also looking into the uh, regulatory frameworks. Uh, as, as someone who worked for the previous uh, several years in AI ethics field, I, I can say that this is something that really uh, is uh, uh, um, taking a lot of space in, in conversations. Like 10 years ago, nobody talked about AI ethics, and then suddenly we have this um, uh, rush of different uh, forums, institutions on a national level, international. Uh, we heard the uh, um, UNESCO's uh, uh, framework for development of ethical AI, even companies committing themselves uh, to, to developing these technologies in an ethical way. Um, there is a challenge, of course, in, in making sure that these principles actually are transferred to practice, that they are not staying only commitment on, on paper. And this is something that we are still uh, lacking, right? Uh, even, even in situation in, in the case of the letter that I uh, mentioned, like organizations, the very same organizations that are calling for this pause as, as a sort of an ethical approach to development of these technologies, uh, making sure that we take time to develop them properly. The very same organizations are firing their ethical uh, AI uh, ethicist teams. Uh, so, so this really does not go one uh, with another. So we need to be um, careful how we actually do this properly and have proper accountability mechanisms. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's um, almost impossible these days to have a conversation about AI without immediately having a conversation about ethics and justice and responsibility and guidelines. So I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, we, we we talked about uh, perhaps some of the neg negative aspects and some of the risks associated uh, with AI. What do you think? What role can AI play in you know our long term prosperity? There there are some fascinating use cases out there that I've read, which are really powerful. What what are some of the ones you've seen that are really pretty cool? Well, I'll I'll be. Uh, absolutely biased here and, and actually mentioned some from my very own field, right? I think you're right. Like there, I mean, if we actually want to look out there and see, there are some really fascinating, uh, there is some really fascinating work being done uh, by many organizations. I am especially excited about this AI for good field, right? The, 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 uh, uh, somebody mentioned in the previous sessions, uh, sustainable development goals. So causes that don't, don't necessarily often get attention attention from uh, private companies, but those that can really make our uh, lives better. Uh, and, and I am especially uh, uh, working in this field of, of applying artificial intelligence for peace building. And I'm seeing lots of very interesting and useful examples, some of them that are actually helping saving lives like artificial intelligence being used in conflict settings to inform populations uh, um, about airstrikes, uh, getting them early warning, or even uh, uh, on, a, on a broader scale, uh, making these systems of conflict early warning and violence early warning systems functioning uh, really well in advance. So we get these red flags properly and, and save lives. Um, we saw the entire boom of this so-called digital witnesses, right? Engagement of individuals in this uh, process of collecting evidence through our phones, through our video cameras and pictures, making sure that we collect evidence uh, uh, in, in cases where uh, human rights are violated, in cases of war crimes, so that we again can actually have accountability. So there are many, many examples uh, of, of these technologies, specifically in peace building, peacemaking, peacekeeping uh, fields uh, that can make our work better and ultimately save lives. Yeah, fascinating. So listen, we're, we're coming towards the end of our interview. We've got about one minute left. I need to go home tonight to my 17 year old and my 18 year old. So how do I what's the call to action? How do I get people not just young people, but all people involved in AI? And what you know, what is the call to action? How do how do we get people to lean in and take part in this conversation? 
Yeah, I, this is really interesting because I, I don't think like five years ago, we had to convince people to become part of this conversation. Now they are naturally <laughs> being part of this. It's become right. so uh, overwhelmingly present everywhere uh, with all generations, right? Not only with your kids, with, with my parents as well. And, and everybody are engaged in this, which I think this comes with a, with a great responsibility as well. And this is my message. I think we should be part of these conversations, all of us, but we also need to be responsible, make sure that we get the information properly to know what is the hype out there, what is the reality, where is the hope to really do our job right properly and make sure uh, we, we make these decisions uh, uh, in, in an informed way and be part of these uh, conversations in a proper way. Amazing. Branka, thank you very much for your time today and thank you for the work you do as well. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.